And this guy, Stanley Stein, he became very, very politically astute. And he realized that not only is this paper will be influential for them, but he, around the world. So he started writing letters to companies that used in their advertising the word leper to talk about somebody who was dead and say, don't use that word. We are human beings, you know, that you, you, you shouldn't be uh, treating us like that. And, and he tried to get people in the world to use the phrase Hansen's disease, which is actually what we now call it. Margaret Talkett, a director at American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society, and the producer of its literary programs. We're delighted to be one of three nonprofit organizations presenting tonight's event along with GBH Forum Network. Tonight's talk is particularly meaningful because our featured book is a personal family history, the stuff of my organization. It's also a shocking medical tale of times past in the United States. Pam's story of her family's uh, history and her whole history, uh, medical history, is truly haunting what her, her husband's family experienced. Um, and of course, the book's insight into medical practices offers new perspectives on all we're facing, all of us, with this COVID pa pandemic. Uh, before we begin, there's some other quick introductions, first from the State Library of Massachusetts. Beth, go ahead. Thank you, Margaret, and hello, everyone. I'm Beth Carroll Horrocks, the head of Special Collections at the State Library of Massachusetts. We are very happy to be able to collaborate with American Ancestors, NEHGS, and the Boston Public Library. Because of the epidemic, we've been able to collaborate in many new ways with other institutions, especially those here in Boston, and even better, to reach a much larger audience. For those things, we're grateful. And we're very, very glad to have you all here tonight. Kristen? Thank you, Beth. On behalf of the Boston Public Library, welcome. I'm Kristen Motti, Adult Programs Librarian. We look forward to this conversation this evening in collaboration with our partners, looking back on history in the context of today's landscape with COVID, as Margaret referenced. Good to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Margaret? And now, at last, our featured author. Pam Fessler is an award-winning correspondent with NPR News, where she covers a wide range of issues, including poverty and philanthropy. She has also worked at N as NPR's senior Washington desk editor, elections editor, and homeland security reporter. Previously, she was a senior writer for Congressional Quarterly Magazine and a reporter at the Record newspaper in Hackensack, New Jersey. Uh, Carvel's Cure is her first book, um, and you, you can, as we have mentioned, get a copy of it through Porter Square Books. The information is on your screen, um, and you'll see this information again, but let's get straight away to Pam. Um, over to you to the uh, introduction to this book. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Margaret, so much for inviting me. I, I really appreciate it. I wish I could be there in person, as I think we all do. Um, and I, I guess the one question people might wonder, why would somebody who, a reporter who covers uh, poverty and voting, which is another big issue I have, write a book about leprosy? And like all good books, it started with a family secret. And my father-in-law called us up. It was 1998. He was an older man at the time. He was 78 years old. And he said, I have something I need to tell you. Um, I, ha I have, I've been keeping something a secret for more than 60 years, um, and I think you should know. He said when he was a teenage boy, he went to school one day, and he came home and his father was gone. And he knew his father was sick, he, had, he knew he actually had leprosy, um, but he didn't know where he was taken, and he actually never saw his father again, or spoke to him. And his mother said, don't ever tell anybody that your father has leprosy because the stigma was so great and the shame was so great. This is back in the 1930s that it, 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 it could destroy the family. So my father-in-law kept this a secret for more than 60 years. But as an older man, he was 78, he decided he couldn't keep this secret anymore. And, and he, he still didn't know what had happened to his father. He knew his father had died, but he didn't know exactly where he went. 
So we decided to start investigating and we discovered that his father had been taken to a leprosarium that was run by the US federal government in Carville, Louisiana. I had no idea that this such a place existed. Um, and so we went down there to visit. And at the time there were still some patients left this, in 1998. And I found out that in fact, there was a, it was an incredible um, story that there was um, a, you know, a, a unbelievable um, amount of, um, not only was his family torn apart, but there were hundreds and hundreds of families uh, that were torn apart because of this disease, which it turns out is not contagious. It's very, it is contagious, but very mildly so. 95% of the human race is naturally immune to this disease. Um, and the other 5% who can get it, it's very, um, it's very mildly contagious. It takes long time sustained contact. So we realized that my father-in-law's father and many other Americans had been confined at this institution more because of the stigma, stigma than the threat that they, um, that they posed. And we do have a picture. I do want to show this picture um, of my uh, father-in-law's father as a young soldier. There he is. So this is Morris Kalnitsky, who was uh, my father-in-law's father. This was taken in 1902 when he was a young soldier in the Spanish-American War. And we believe that that is where he picked up this disease. And that was, as I say, 1902. His first symptoms did not show until 1922 which just shows what an incredibly slow developing disease it is. And it also shows how, how it was not that contagious, but because of the stigma and the image that people had about leprosy, it was just, it, had, it has taken on this um, image of a highly um, contagious and very, very dangerous disease. Um, and then the first picture that we show, I don't know if you, we're going to show that picture again. Believe it or not, this is how Carville began. It started out as a state institution in Louisiana. It was the Louisiana Leper Home. And you may wonder, why am I showing you this image of this incredibly decaying, um, clearly an uninhabitable mansion? Well, when the state of Louisiana decided that they wanted to create a home for people who had leprosy in the late 1800s. They wanted to do it in New Orleans, but nobody would allow the hospital to be built anywhere near them because of the fear of this disease. And so the only place they could find was this abandoned plantation 70 miles away from New Orleans um, on a very, very remote area along the Mississippi River. They, the Louisiana Leper Home Board of Control, which was the state organization, took the patients, there were a few patients, they were in um, at the time what was called the Pest House in New Orleans, and they took them in the middle of the night on a barge up the river to this place. And this is what it looked like when they arrived. Um, they didn't tell any of the neighbors that this was going to become a home for people with leprosy. They told them, in fact, it was going to be turned into an ostrich farm because they didn't want the neighbors to, um, to, to object it or to, to block them from starting this. And so when they came and saw how decrepit it was, they put the patients in the slave quarters that were in the back because they were actually more, um, um, the former slave quarters, they were more inhabitable. And I think I show that picture because that is, a sign of what people really wanted to do with people with leprosy. They wanted them taken away as far away as possible. They just didn't want people with this disease, which everybody feared um, anywhere near them. And so it was run as a state institution for a couple of decades. And there was then growing concern around the United States in the early 1900s that the, the federal government 
should do something about people with leprosy. There weren't that many patients, but they, it, there was a public hysteria about this disease. And so in 1921, the federal government decided to create a leprosarium. Once again, they tried all different places that they wanted to build this leprosarium. Nobody wanted it. Anytime they mentioned that they were going to try and build it in Florida and Georgia, somewhere else, the residents went crazy and said, no, we don't want this home anywhere near us. So eventually the federal government bought that um, institution from the state of Louisiana and it became the National Leprosarium. And when we went down there and visited, it's still there today. It's, it's not run as a leprosarium, but the institution is still there. I realized what an incredible, incredible place it was and what incredible patients there were and their stories, not only about what happened to them personally, but also what they did to eventually fight for their rights. And I just want to read one little passage, just kind of set the scene for you, and then we can discuss the book. During the 20th century, leprosy patients went to Carville to be cared for and more often than not, isolated for life. Some arrived voluntarily because they were seriously ill and had nowhere else to go, but many were taken there against their will, sometimes in shackles or locked in the boxcars of trains. One man came in the back of a hearse. Another was hidden in a bag. Patients were torn from their families and babies born inside Carville were taken from their mothers and put up for adoption. Parents abandoned children, husbands abandoned wives. Those confined to the leprosarium lost no, not only their freedom, but their identity and their civil rights. Until 1946, patients were stripped of their right to vote. In the eyes of the law, they were seen more as inmates than as the innocent victims of a serious disease. New arrivals were advised to assume aliases to protect their families from embarrassment and attack. Morris Kalnitsky, that's my father-in-law's father, who shortened his name after the war to Cole, became Morris Krug. In Carville Cemetery, tombstones were more likely to bear a patient's alias and case number than his or her actual name. For more than a century, this was a world unto itself and unlike any other. Now a little bit about our moderator before we start the conversation. Guest moderator, Dr. Laura Colby, is a physician, writer, and book critic. She is an assistant professor of medicine and a fellow in the Division of Medical Ethics at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical Center. Welcome, Laura. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with you tonight, Pam. Um, what you. an incredible book. What an unbelievable story. I was shocked um, and then shocked at my shock because <laughs> I felt that this ought to have been part of my medical education. So um, what a service that you've, you've done for us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wonder if we could start by um, just asking you to fill out um, a slightly more textured portrait of what Carville was like as a place. What was a day in the life like for these patients, for these uh, community members? Right. So it, it changed dramatically over the years. Um, by the time the federal government took over in 1921 and they were starting to bring patients from all around the country, um, I would say there were about maybe uh, 300 patients or so, kind of range between three and 500 patients. And this facility, despite that very decrepit looking mansion, by that time they had fixed up the mansion and they had started building dorms for the patients. And they were connected by these long screened in um, open air corridors because a lot of the patients were in wheelchairs. So that way they could easily move from building to building. And it, it was on, or is on a 350 acre site along the river. And actually it's quite gorgeous. Um, there's beautiful um, uh, live oak trees there now. And um, well, there were at the time, obviously there were they're hundreds of years old and um, it, in some ways, it became, although it was a hospital, and these patients, many of them were brought there against their will, and they could not leave, um, and there was a fence around it, it, it became kind of a haven inside for them, because they were not, people who were diagnosed with leprosy were not 
treated very well by the outside world. So inside you had this world, this community. There were old patients, there were young patients, there were children, there were um, people who were highly educated, there were illiterate patients, um, and, and, and there were um, all races and ethnicities. There were black patients, there were white patients. It, it was a, kind of an extraordinary world within a world. And because the federal government realized that these patients were going to, some of them maybe spend their entire lives there because they could not leave unless they were cured and there was no cure at the time, they developed all these social um, activities. They had sporting teams, they had plays, they had music teams, I mean, music um, musicals that they put on, they had dances. Um, they developed, um, uh, there, there's one of the dances. This is a little bit later on, um, but as you can see, they tried to make it as much a world um, as possible that these people could live uh, and, and actually thrive. And the federal government and the public health service realized that if these patients had some semblance of a normal life, even though they were in sense prisoners, that they would work towards their own um, um, improvement and treatment. Um, and that, that they would be in better shape if they were better mental uh, uh, condition. Um, the other thing that they created was a newspaper there, which uh, a patient newspaper, and we can talk about that more later, but it became one of the leading um, crusading voices for people with leprosy, not only here in the United States, not only at Carville or in the United States, but around the world. So this all developed over time. I mean, it started in the 1920s when the federal government took over and it was over the uh, next decades that, um, you know, th this community was created. I love that image of the dancers. And one thing that I love about it, besides the sheer effervescent joy of the image is um, how it illustrates one of the really intriguing paradoxes in your book, which is that this was a place of confinement. And in some ways, um, the robbing people or suspension of their civil liberties. And yet inside this community, the paradox is that there were things happening that were more equitable or more advanced, um, more progressive than what was happening in the rest of Louisiana or the rest of the United States. Um, it's just so fascinating to me. Why do you think that was able to flourish in that community? Yeah, I, I think part of it was because, um, you know, these patients were bound together. As I, I mentioned, they, you know, just a real cross section of America, but they were bound together by this shared stigma that they had. They were, they were discriminated against by, from, by the outside world because of their disease. But inside Carville, they could share, they, they, they were with people who understood what they were going through. So you're right, here you are in um, the South, the deep South, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and you had, they, they had a small school there. For, you know, it was, it was integrated. The sporting teams were integrated. The dances were integrated. Um, it was extraordinary. I mean, it was a world that was just it way in advance of what was going on outside. And I believe that that actually helped strengthen the patients as a community and gave them strength to eventually decide that we need to fight for our rights. We need, this is unjust that we are being held inside this institution for a disease that they all at that time, they pretty much all knew it was not that contagious because none of the healthcare workers there ever contracted the disease. Um, and they saw people outside with TB or other diseases that were much more contagious, but because of the stigma of, of leprosy, they were stuck there and they lost their families and everything. And, and, and they started fighting back. It's just amazing how that sense of community became this catalyst. Um, but I, I'm still just racking my brain to understand why would the government do this? It just seems like such an extreme public health measure. Right. And I think it was, um, you know, around the turn of the century, and it, it, this was both because of, um, you know, what, what led to 
Louisiana starting this home that, that you, you know, as I'm sure you guys, you well know, you, around the turn of the century, people were much more aware of germs and the fact that germs cause diseases. And it was also a time of great immigration. And there was a, a feeling that immigrants were bringing these dangerous germs into the country and people feeling like we need to do something about it. And, um, you know, I, I, leprosy at the time, you know, you also, you had the, the images from the Bible that this was this terrible, terrible disease. Um, and, and for people, you know, who have advanced cases, it, it can be very repulsive looking, you know, with, the, with lesions on their faces. You know, I think, those, I think that all came together. So there was a sense that we needed to do something about it. And there were a couple of high profile cases um, there was somebody, I don't know if you remember the character, John Early, who was this patient who came to Washington, D.C., and he just was coming there to get his pension, and he's got a rash on his face, and he decided to go see the doctor, and the doctor comes in. He doesn't really know what it is, and John Early goes, oh, what have I got, doctor? Um, leprosy? And the doctor kind of freaked out. And they took John Early, this was in 1908, they took John Early, all of his belongings, they rushed him to a quarantine tent on the banks of the Potomac River with a guard where they kept him for months because they didn't know what to do. And it became a huge story around the country that there was a I'm going to use in quotes, leper in um, Washington, D.C. And hundreds of people came from all over um, to see him. And he was a good example. The government didn't know, and the public health um, community didn't know what to do with him. And this went on for ages and ages and ages, but it was such a high profile case that ultimately was the case of John Early that led Congress to create the National Leprosarium. And so it was not only this fear of the disease, but I also feel like there was a lot of anti-immigrant, even though a lot of these patients were not um, they, immigrants, they were foreign born, it was just all brought into this feeling of anti-immigration and that um, you know we need to do something about this disease. There was a great feeling that um, Chinese immigrants were bringing in leprosy. And quite frankly, the disease was used as a weapon against them, um, uh, you know, to, 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 to integrate them. And so I think all of that came together. Um, Absolutely. And actually, I should, should I mention one other thing. I'm sorry. And, and that is, there were doctors who at the time did think that it was good public policy and health policy. They did believe, because we didn't understand much about the disease, they did believe that if you take the patients and isolate them, that it would eventually eradicate, eradicate the disease. Mm -hmm. But because of this long incubation period, I, I, actually that didn't work out. <laughs> um, instead, it just scared people away because they said, oh my goodness, if I go to a doctor and he finds out I, or she finds out I have leprosy, I'm gonna be stuck in this place. I'm not gonna go to the doctor. Right, right, absolutely. And so then it seems like a major turning point was the discovery that this disease was in fact bacterial and treatable like most other bacterial diseases um, with the work of Dr. Hansen, who first saw the bacteria under the microscope and kind of put two and two together. Um, and after that, it's just astonishing to me that the dramatic level of um, cure um, that people were able to achieve. Do you think now's a good time to look at the- Yeah, yeah, let's look at those. But so, so, yeah, so- Yeah, so, so, fill that in for us. Yeah. So for, for decades and decades, um, even at Carvel, they tried everything um, to figure out how to cure this disease. And, and they really couldn't find anything, but, but the federal government did have a research facility. Um, there were doctors and labs at Carville. And the patients themselves were also very um, eager um, to try and find a cure. So they, they really kind of tried almost everything. In 1941, the chief medical officer there um, whose expertise was tuberculosis, heard that there was this um, sulfone um, um, medication called Promen that had been used on TB patients. It didn't really have much of an effect, but there's very similar, a lot of similarity between the diseases. He said, okay, why don't we just try it on the patients at Carville and see what happens? So they got some volunteers and they started injecting them with this medication. This is a, a patient 
who, this is her picture in 1940. And as you can see, have, she has a very, very um, advanced case of the disease. And she had not been taking the medication then. She was one of the ones who was given the medication. Here she is in 1943 after taking it for a year or so. Okay, and then show the next picture. That's a 45, and then the final picture. That's 1947. As you can see, she looks perfectly normal. Everything has gone. And this is what they call the, the miracle at Carville. This was the first time that any medication was found that actually did anything to um, alleviate the symptoms. Now, it took decades after that for the science community, medical community to come up with a combination of drugs that we now use today that, in fact, can cure people of this um, uh, disease quite quickly. Um, but it was there at Carville that this started. These images are so powerful, and they remind me of another thing that I love about your book, which is that um, it doesn't overly center the doctors or the researchers, which I feel like a lot of books about episodes in medical history do, but it really just squarely centers the patients. And it's so interwoven with their voices, their testimonies, um, the things they went through with their loved ones, with other people in their families and communities. And there's just so many stirring portraits. Um, and for you as a journalist, I know that this is kind of your bread and butter, is bringing the voices of other people to life. I'm curious how, how you see your um, your professional career up to now is kind of giving you the tools that you needed in order to bring these people to life and elicit their voices in this book. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I, I've always, especially at NPR, you know, that's what we do is we tell stories. And I, I came to this because of my father-in-law. Mm -hmm. I was so struck by how this had affected his life. And then when I started researching and how it had affected other people's lives, their families, not only the patients, but also their families and the repercussions, that that's really like how I came to this story, that this was a, 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 a human story about how stigma and disease affects people. And quite frankly, the medical stuff was the stuff that I knew least about and was most nervous about doing, you know, but obviously it's such a, a key part of the story. Uh, but I was very nervous about writing that part <laughs> because it was not my um, expertise. But definitely, um, you know, just writing about the people. And I had so much material to work with. It was yeah. wonderful. There, a number of the patients wrote memoirs that were very descriptive. Uh, this newspaper, The Star, that I mentioned, the patient newspaper, it came out monthly for decades and decades. In fact, it still exists, believe it or not. And it, it talked in great detail about everything that the patients were doing. And then the other one was the, um, the nurses at the um, hospital. They were the daughters of charity. And they had become the nurses there when it was just the Louisiana leper home because they couldn't find anybody else who would come to this remote area and take care of these patients. And the only people they could get were the daughters of charity. When the federal government took over, same thing. They couldn't find anybody else who wanted to work there. So the federal government actually hired these sisters as civil servants and they stayed there until 2005, believe it or not. But anyway, they were meticulous record keepers. They kept diaries of every day at Carville. So I, I, I really had a gold mine of, of uh, information to draw from. And it was, and it was personal. It was all, you know, you, it was all human, um, you know, tragedy, but also, um, you know, love. People fell in love. There were love stories. Um, and, 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 there was also uh, eventually this fight that the patients banded together after the cure, especially, and decided, you know, we need to fight for our rights. So it, it, it became a major advocacy movement. Um, it, 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 the human resilience is just amazing. Yeah. I want to talk about the star for just a moment because I, I love that part of the story. And um, for me, what's so interesting is that the emergence of this newspaper is sort of the cumulative point after a series of small subversions where a few patients say, I don't like the way things are going. Like, I'm gonna push back. I'm gonna push the envelope. I'm gonna advocate for myself. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about that story? 
Yeah, I mean, the newspaper started, it actually can be attributed uh, to this one particular patient. His name is Stanley Stein. And he arrived in 1931. He was a young man, um, but he was he was really brilliant. And he loved to write. Um, he, he actually was a pharmacist in Texas when he was diagnosed with leprosy. And when he first got there, he just, he, he thought that the, pe the patients there seemed very, um, listless and hopeless. And he decided that he wanted to change that. And one of the things he did is he went to the powers of B and said, can I have a patient newspaper? And initially, you know, it was just a mimeograph sheet that, you know, talked about the menu Sunday night and what movies were showing. It was a, but slowly but surely the patients started writing articles questioning, why is the government doing this to me? And it just grew and grew and grew. And this guy, Stanley Stein, he became very, very politically astute. And he realized that not only is this paper will be influential for them, but he, around the world. So he started writing letters to companies that used in their advertising the word leper to talk about somebody who was dead and say, don't use that word. We are human beings, you know, that you, you, you shouldn't be uh, treating us like that. And, and he tried to get people in the world to use the phrase Hansen's disease, which is actually what we now call it today. Um, but the other thing is he recruited outsiders to help get the message out. And um, they, the American Legion actually helped because a number of these patients, like my father-in-law's um, father, were veterans. So the American Legion kind of adopted the star and the patients as a cause, and they spread the message around the country. And then the other thing was Broadway and Hollywood. And Stanley had a mutual friend with a big actress at the time, Tallulah Bankhead. Uh, this was in the late 1940s. And one day, Stanley was um, called to the front office and told that there was a phone call for him. And when he picked up the phone, there was this deep, gravelly voice and said, hello, darling, this is Tallulah. <laughs> anyway, and he, of course, almost keels over. But they developed an extraordinary friendship. And she offered to help in any way that she could. And she got all of her Hollywood friends and Broadway friends to subscribe to the star and to try and get the message out that these patients were not being treated fairly. Why were they confined at this institution? Um, and at one point, after the medication um, that we talked about before um, started helping patients, they were allowed to go on leave um, if they uh, appeared to be getting better. And at one point, Stanley was uh, invited by Tallulah up to New York City, and he went up there for a whirlwind tour. He went to all these Broadway shows. He talked to the media. It was a huge story. And I just love this photo because after what they went to one uh, show, she invited him back to his, her apartment in Manhattan for a... Um, for a party, and this is photo appeared in the local newspaper of Stanley and uh, Tallulah snuggling with their drinks. And the message was so important. Yeah. She was showing, I am not afraid of somebody who has leprosy. They're, this person is not a threat to me. And that was the message he wanted to get out. It's such an intimate gesture. It's unbelievable. I loved this uh, in particular because when I was growing up, whenever uh, I or my sister were being divas or drama queens, my, my mom would say, oh, don't be such a Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> she, she was brought to life for me by this book, and I was happy to see her heroic side as a public health advocate. So, um, <laughs> um, But that's just so, so incredible. And I think that you're book does so much to explain how this stigma was slowly um, chipped away at, which is something that's arisen so many times in American public health history. And you draw this really striking parallel between public perceptions of um, Hansen's disease with early public perceptions of um, HIV and AIDS. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how that analogy holds up, kind of what what's the same and what's different about how the public responded to these things that they saw as scary threats. 
Well, well, I think that's what it is. Is you know, people are scared because they don't know. That was the case with leprosy. They didn't really know that it was not that contagious. Um, we certainly had that with HIV initially, um, and and you know, we have it with many diseases, including um, COVID nineteen. But I think what it is, is that the reaction is often to denigrate and demonize the victims, the people who have this disease. That was certainly the case um, with HIV, you know, with people with leprosy because of the Bible. Sometimes it was seen as this is a sign of somebody being a sinner. You know, this is God's punishment for, for sin. And certainly with HIV initially, oh, you know, these people are, you know, they're homosexuals or they're drug, um, drug addicts. And, and that allowed people to kind of dismiss the, the need to treat um, some of these patients. And the idea was just let's shove them away and hope, hope the problem goes away instead of actually dealing with the problem. Yeah, it's, um, it's astonishing how that emotional force actually winds up shaping policy, right. um, in some ways blinding us to medical facts or to thinking about this in a more data-driven way about you know, how big is this risk. Um, I think it's time to start weaving in some audience questions, which are wonderful, wonderful questions. Um, and we've received a few that are kind of along the lines of, um, can you tell us more about just why was this disease the frightening one? When there were actually, you know, throughout American history, many other also, you know, quite terrifying or deadly diseases, smallpox, polio, um, you know, why, why Hansen's disease got this uh, outsized or, or particularly, um, striking response by public health in, in the U.S.? I mean, I do think that it was a partly the physical appearance, uh, the manifestation of it, even though a lot of people who are diagnosed with leprosy show no signs. I mean, you, you don't even see it. It might just be a numbness in their hands and their feet. Um, but I do think that, you know, this image is so ingrained in our culture, um, you know, for centuries, people had this image that, that, that leprosy was um, one highly contagious and terrible. And I do think the Bible, I mean, it just really, um, you know, so, as I say, ingrained that image that this is not only um, a disease, but a sign of somebody being evil or bad. And, um, you know, I, 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 I also think, that I didn't realize this at the time, but there was, Ben-Hur was not only a movie, but it had before that been a book, which was the most popular book besides the Bible in the late 1800s. And I had no idea. And in that book, as you might recall, uh, Ben-Hur's mother and sister both are, contract leprosy and they are cast out of the city. And he describes them in incredibly um, terrible uh, description of, you know, their skin falling off. And I think that that resonated with people. I mean, people just felt like this was a terrible disease. And again, the solution was send them away. Just get rid of them. We don't want to look at these people. You know, we don't want to deal with them. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of some questions that were sent in um, before this session, which were about how, um, you know, your story is a national story, but emphasizes Carville in particular. But um, in your research, were there other colonies for leprosy in the U.S. or in the world that, um, that also fascinated you, that, that you um, kind of took a little detour in your research to find out more about? Um, well, the most famous one, uh, uh, at least for most Americans, is in uh, Molokai in Hawaii. Yeah. And so that was um, started in the mid um, 1800s by the Hawaiian government at the time. And there's a lot of similarity between the way that was run and the way Carville was run, although they didn't have this um, advanced medical research facility there. Um, but it was partly that that led to the creation of Carville because there was a priest named Father Damien, who many people might know of, who um, went to work with the uh, patients at, um, at Molokai. And he, in fact, did contract the disease and um, died. And that was an a, a, a international story. Mm -hmm. And that's what made everybody think, oh my goodness, this is a really contagious disease. Yeah. And even though, as I say, 95% of the human race can't get it. Well, he was one of the 5%, you know? <laughs> and so that led to that. So there was that. Um, 
around the United States before Carville was created as a federal institution, there were pockets of, um, of I wouldn't even really call them uh, leprosariums, but uh, patients who were kept, they were kept in what were called like pest houses at mm-hmm. the time, you know, around the turn of the century, people with contagious diseases or some in San Francisco. And then in, um, off the coast of Massachusetts in, um, on Penakese Island around 1905, Um, They set up a a leprosy colony for a few patients. Um, I think ultimately there were a few dozen um, over the years. Very similar. Let's get these people out of here, get them as far away as possible. When Carville was created as a federal institution, those patients were all taken and shipped down to, to Louisiana because the states didn't want to have to deal with this. I mean, that was another reason that the federal government did, because the states were like, what are we going to do with these people? We don't want to have to deal with it. Mm-hmm. We've gotten several questions about um, what the current uh, status of Hansen's, Hansen's disease is right now, um, either in the U.S. or internationally. And in particular, um, how severe is it? Is it treatable now? Um, what, what's life like for people with Hansen's disease around the world? So um, there are about 200 new cases a year diagnosed in the United States. But around the world, there are 200,000 new cases every year that are diagnosed. Um, And they're mostly in Israel, I mean Israel, (laughs) Um, India and um, Brazil. And um, there's a a variety. I mean, here in the United States, when somebody is diagnosed, they can still be treated. The federal government still runs outpatient clinics, the National Hansen's Disease Program. Um, And there's actually one, their main facility is in Baton Rouge. Um, It's sort of an offshoot of of Carville. Um, And right now, patients, if they get the, the treatment that's available, Within about, within about 48 to 78 hours, 72 hours, I've been told that they are no longer contagious at all if they take this drug. And that within about a year, it's completely, the, the, the germ is completely gone um, from their bodies. So it is easily curable if people get the disease, but the stigma still remains. And so people do not go seek treatment because they're still afraid of how they are going to be treated by their families. In India, there are still many, many colonies where people with leprosy live. And um, the medication not only works, but the WHO and uh, the Novartis Foundation have made it free to anybody in the world who needs it, but still people don't um, get treated. And, and then they get these they very advanced cases. Yeah, it's hard to imagine that a disease that's so easily treatable today um, still lingers with us. Um, Yeah, and can I just say one other thing which really shocked me was of the 200 patients in the United States, um, they did a survey of the patients who were admitted to the National Hansen's Disease Disease Program, and about 50% of them said that they, when they were first diagnosed, they contemplated suicide because they were so worried about how they would be treated by their communities and by people that they knew. That's even today. Wow, that's just shocking. We have a couple related questions that I'll try to tie together. Um, One one person in the audience would like to know whether there is a particular anecdote that you just wished you could put in the manuscript, there wasn't quite enough room. And then a related question is, um, just tell us more stories about the small acts of subversion or kind of self (laughs) self-advocacy that, that people did. Here, um, the, the questioner said, uh, you know, they heard that patients snuck out of Carville from time to time. So either an anecdote that's in the book or one that, you know, kind of got left on the cutting room floor, but a little bit more about what these patients were doing. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of interesting because the patients, they had what was called the hole in the fence. So that was surrounded by this, you know, um, barbed wire top chain link fence. But, you know, it was a big facility. So in one little corner, the patients had lifted up one part of the fence and they used to sneak out. And um, sometimes they snuck out and left for, for good. But a lot of times, you know, as I say, the world outside wasn't so great for people with leprosy. Sometimes they'd just sneak out. They'd go to, there was a bar down the street called, I think it was 
the red hen, I forget what the name of it was. And they used to go like the, a lot of the guys would go down there and go drinking or they would go into Baton Rouge and, and, and you know, go dancing. Um, but then they would come back. And I loved those stories. I mean, they were just so, um, you know, it was kind of like a wink, wink, nod, nod. You know, they kind of, even, even the doctors knew that the patients escaped sometimes. And I think that, um, they realized they had to let people let steam out or there would be a re rebellion. I, one story that strikes uh, that I do recall, um, and I wanna say it just because we're getting so close to an election, you know, the, the patients lost their right to vote until 1946 um, because they were in Louisiana viewed as inmates, so they could not vote. Um, and there's a story about this one patient who every election would sneak out and, and go vote somewhere. And he did it for five elections. And when you came back, if you snuck out and they caught you, they actually had a little jail inside of Carville. And you might have to go to that jail for like 30 days or 60 days. So this guy would go out and vote, come back, and he'd be stuck in jail for like 30 days. Um, but he still went and voted. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, it seems like a time to nod to the present day. And um, you know your your book because of you know the time scale in which books come out obviously cannot directly reference COVID. Um, but I'm curious since the book's emergence in the world, um, what thoughts have you had about how the story of Carville um, can teach us something as we live the story of COVID currently? Well, and this is something I would definitely love to have your perspective on too. Um, um, I, I, I think what struck me is just how the lack of knowledge. Um, just leads to misinformation and leads to people responding to this uh, disease in, in the way that they, their prejudices kind of tell them they should, you know, that, that decisions are often made not because it's good um, medical practice or good public policy, but because people sort of think, oh, well, this, you know, we don't really know, you know, this is, this, this is what I think we should do. And, you know, that it was sort of the opposite with Carville, you know, they, they shut people away when it wasn't that contagious, but here we have a disease that is, you know, highly contagious and a lot of people don't take it seriously. But I think a lot of it is because of this misinformation and, and, you know, a, a lack of um, knowledge sometimes about exactly how diseases are, ca are caused. I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, it's it's incredibly striking. What what has the legacy of this been for you and your family? This and sorry, this will be I think our last question just because of time. Right. I'm sorry. The legacy for my family. Yeah. Well, well, um, I, I guess you know I don't want to give away the end. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Um, but, yeah, it, it was very profound impact on our family. And I, I think that, you know, the interesting thing that I found out is that there were actually um, much more fascinating stories than my family's story. And I, um, I have, since I wrote this book, have had all these people who've come out of the woodwork, people who said, oh, I had an aunt who was there, or, or people who were actually patients there. Wow. And it, it's just wonderful to think. And I think that the long, the best thing, um, I, I just think that the, the human resilience in this story, there was so much hope. And, um, you know, that's the thing that just gives me hope sort of for the future of us dealing with future diseases or the current disease. And um, I, I guess, do you want me to, do they want me to read the uh, sort of final? I think that'd be wonderful. Before you do, I just want to say that so many excellent questions have been asked and my apologies for not getting to all of them. But Pam, I know that you've, you've generously said that you'd love to address these questions in some other time. Um, do you have a, a way for people to contact you? Yeah, I know. There's lots of questions. Um, so if you just send a note, just uh, info at pamfessler.com, I will be happy to answer your questions. Um, okay, well, I actually would be interested in your thoughts about this as well. Um, and I hope you read the book so you have even more questions. <laughs> um, I, I, so, so this um, little excerpt that I want to read, um, this came, uh, this is after World War II, the patients 
they were really invigorated, like all Americans. They, they were very much, they were very patriotic. They had victory gardens. They really worked very hard to support um, the, uh, the, the, the American cause. But then the war was coming to an end and they realized they were still stuck inside of Carville. And the unfairness of that really resounded with the patients. And um, I just want to read this one little passage, which this is when they really began to fight for their rights. The patients were clearly emboldened by the Allies' impending victory in World War II. America was on the threshold of leading the world into a new era of human rights, and Carville patients did not want to be left behind. Don't Fence Me In, a hit tune at the time, became their unofficial anthem. The songs seem to have been written expressly for them. While the hospital administrators expected protests from Stanley Stein, he was the newspaper editor, and some of the other more defiant patients, it was a shock when the very proper Betty Martin weighed in. She was a debutante at the time. Her rage had been building as she watched friends who were discharged, still being treated like pariahs, even though they no longer tested positive for the disease. Some former patients were asked to stop shopping at the local grocery store or to take their children out of the local school. It was no wonder that some of the patients who were cleared for release began to have second thoughts and consider not going home. Betty poured out their collective frustrations in the July 1945 edition of The Star with a column entitled, Why Am I Not Free? Why am I, an American, denied my rightful heritage? liberty, justice, and the pursuit of happiness, when my only crime is being sick. She began a long list of questions. The article resonated not only at Carville, it was reprinted in the Louisiana Legionnaire magazine, and copies were sent to members of Congress who contacted the Surgeon General to find out what was going on down at the nation's leprosarium. Betty received letters from people around the country who expressed sympathy. Johnny Harmon, that's another patient, worked at the Star as both a photographer and an illustrator. He drew the cover art for that issue of the paper and perfectly captured the patient's distress. The illustration shows a Carville patient staring longingly out his window at the American flag by the front gate, and beyond that to the barbed wire topped fence. A John Doe letter sits on his desk. A wall calendar has the words, July 4th, Independence Day, buy bonds for freedom. A question mark hangs over the patient's head and the caption reads, with liberty and justice for all. And then the story goes on from there. <laughs> we at American Ancestors and EHGS are honored to be part of this event, presenting such heartfelt American stories and working with fine partners here in Boston. Uh, Pam, I know you're down in Washington and Laura in New York. Um, we we want all of you to know out in, the, out in the outer world that our doors, our virtual doors at American Ancestors are wide open to anyone looking to research their own family history, um, like Pam's or any history that, that you have um, on all sides. You can connect with our genealogists on the phone, over Twitter, or through our website, AmericanAncestors.org, where you'll also find downloadable research guides, free educational resources, and many other author events and webinars to come as well as videos of past events, uh, many of them with the library and the state library. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and connect. Um, driven by our love of history and stories, we, this team of nonprofit partners, all of us tonight, will be presenting more of these authors' talks in the weeks and months ahead. Um, and meanwhile, though, back to tonight, we really want to thank all of you. We hope to host you again um, virtually for these various events. Um, but for now, a safe and inspirational evening to everyone. And thanks for joining us. A good night to all. Pam, Laura, Kristen, Beth, uh, Annie, everyone, thank you so much. <laughs>